Good morning and welcome to this service of worship with Lorraine Avenue Mennonite Church. If you wish, I invite you to light a Christ candle. This is a reminder that we are united in spirit and that God's presence is always among us. Also, a quick reminder at this point in time to have your microphone and video off, and then we'll invite you to turn on your video um, so that we can see one another when we join in song. Please join me in the call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord our God. The maker of heaven and earth. Who comes to our aid in times of need who gives us the courage to do what we know is right, who invites us to turn away from the influences of the world around us and confess God alone as Savior and Lord. This is our God. Let's worship together. I invite you now to turn on your videos and we will sing together um, hymn number 48, All Creatures of Our God and King. One, three, four, seven. Verses 1, 3, 4, and 7.
Now is the time for children with Jill Robinson. And so we invite children to gather around and hear what Jill has to share with us today. We've now come to the point in the service where if we were meeting all together in person, the ushers would gather our offerings and tithes. And we are grateful for those who are able, who have continued to give gifts and offerings to the church because it has helped us to continue to serve the community within our congregation, in our city, and beyond. Please join me in prayer. Please join Molly in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for gifts that belong not to us alone, but to all our sisters and brothers, since they too are created in your image. Let their need become our need. Let their hunger become our hunger, and grant us also a portion of the, their pain, so that in sharing ourselves we discover Christ who walked with our brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. We will now sing, We Worship the Rock which is number 28 in the Seeing the Journey book. And if you like, you may turn on your video so that we can see one another as well. Our scripture this morning is Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, 
And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now it is time for the sermon from Pastor Christina. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you'll perhaps have noted, I am flying solo today, so bear with me as I um, do a few technical things, which take a little longer when there's only one of me. I have to let you know that um, in trying to light my candle earlier, I almost caused a disaster, so go being by myself is going very well. But I'm really excited to share with you about this passage today. I really like it. Um, I wasn't very, when I first read it, read it this week, I was a little unsure where to go because it seems a little obvious in some ways, but as I looked at it further, I found lots to talk about. So, I can picture the disciple, a different story in which Jesus shows up and people go, who are you anyway? And this is a question that's often asked at those climactic moments in stories, like, you know, a masked figure shows up and appears on screen and fights off the bad guys, saves the protagonists of the film, and then eventually they turn to the main characters and the main characters of the show, they say, who are you anyway? And that's revealed and the story goes on. And I really actually quite like that trope. I think it's quite, um, quite fun. But Jesus, ever the contrarian, ever not the same as what we maybe expect, doesn't follow this trope. To be sure, people do ask him the equivalent of, who do you think you are in the Gospels? We see that actually just earlier in chapter 16, the Pharisees are continuing to question Jesus and ask, basically ask him, who do you think you are to be doing all of these things? But instead, the question that Jesus, Jesus turns the question on its head and says, who do people say that I am? And lest we think of this as some self-centered question Jesus asks because he's a people pleaser who cares too much about what people think of him, we get that next question soon after, right? But who do you say that I am. And from Peter's answer and Jesus' subsequent reaction to that answer, we realize that that was the more important question all along, the question that gets to the very heart of Jesus' presence on earth. Jesus' question, who do you say that I am, cuts through the narrative and straight to the heart of the disciples. It cuts through all the other possibilities that he is Elijah, that he is John the Baptist, or he is Jeremiah, or another prophet, and asks for a true, heartfelt answer regarding Jesus's identity. It was important for the disciples, and it is important for us now that we, us now today, that we let this question cut through the narrative and to our hearts. Allow Jesus to ask you, who do you say that I am? Who do we say that Jesus is? Perhaps, knowing this passage, we might simply respond, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Perhaps simply, Son of God, that's the shorthand many of us use. Some of us might see Jesus mostly as our Savior, maybe our personal friend. And still, some of us might be unsure about who we say Jesus is. We might ha not have a very specific understanding of Jesus. We may know only what others say about him, that he is the son of God, the savior of the world, God incarnate, fully God and fully human, 
but maybe we're not sure we can say all of those things ourselves, that we believe all those things ourselves. Because believing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and everything else about Jesus should change us. If we believe in Jesus' identity as Messiah, we will not stay the same. Believing and interacting with Jesus the Messiah will not leave us untouched. Once we are caught up in that divine dance, we are forever changed. We are not the same. And it seems to me that Peter sort of gets this. He knew he was right when he said what he said. He, maybe he didn't know immediately when he said it, but he knew it when he heard Jesus' response, and he knew it even more as he witnessed more and more of Jesus' life. Jesus goes on to describe the coming church, right? And says that Peter will have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, things will change because of this truth of Jesus' identity. What this passage stops short of, however, is the turn toward Jerusalem and Jesus' death. That's literally just the next verse. In 16, verse 21, chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the leaders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter is not pleased with this message. In fact, the Peter who was just blessed rebukes Jesus for saying this. And Jesus in response declares, get behind me, Satan. Peter has a lot of moments in which his faith ebbs and flows. But what happened here? What changed so quickly that Peter went from kind of the top student to Satan, which I think is a considerably less pleasant nickname than Peter, or Rocky, as some might say. Like I said, I think Peter knew that things could not remain the same after the declaration and affirmation of Jesus as Messiah. But, and it's been said before, Jesus, or Peter, and the others were probably expecting a different kind of, of Messiah, a different kind of change. The word Messiah means anointed one, one set apart for a holy purpose. There are many anointed ones found in the Hebrew scriptures. Even a Persian king, Cyrus, is referred to as anointed because of his position in allowing the Hebrew people to return to Israel. Now, over the centuries, the word Messiah, the, the, the title Messiah, took on a more eschatological meaning. Eschatology is just the study or beliefs of the end of things, the end times. Eschatological teachings about the Messiah in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, they look forward to a ruler from the line of David that would gain power. And in Jesus' time, the view was that they would over the Messiah would overthrow the weight of Rome off the shoulders of the Hebrew people. There are periods, there are books from the period just before Jesus' life on earth, called the Second Temple Period in scholarship. And those books are first and second Maccabees. There are other books, but the ones I'm talking about right now. And they demonstrate that there's this hope for a strong political leader. There are those strong political leaders in the books of first and second Maccabees. It's possible, even likely, that Peter was expecting Jesus to be like those Maccabees who led rebellions against occupying forces. But hopefully they would be more successful and long lasting than the Maccabees ever were. And I believe. I believe that Peter thought things would change when he uttered those words, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. I think he knew that. But the change he was expecting wasn't the change that was going to happen. Imagine believing that Jesus is the next mighty rebellion leader, then hearing him say in almost the next breath that he had to go to Jerusalem to die. These things don't add up to Peter, thus his rebuke. And I 
think sometimes we want to blame Peter and say that he was very foolish for believing this. No, it was laid out. It seemed very, it was very reasonable for Peter to be convinced that Jesus would be a rebellion leader. That was the paradigm he was working in, at least I think so. And seeing the jump that happens in Matthew 16 from so correct, so right to so wrong should give us pause. We might know, perhaps, that things have to change if we believe personally that Jesus is the Messiah. We know that. But how do we expect that change? What do we expect to change? What do we want to change? And is it the same things that God wants to change? What do we envision when we envision a world that is never the same? A nice full church? A large Sunday school, hymns sung in perfect harmony, potlucks every single week. It might be a hard question even to think about right now because everything has changed. But I do believe it's worth thinking about what we, what, what we hope for. And the things I listed, those are good things to hope for. And indeed, I don't want to downplay the fact that what I am describing in reality is community. And communities can be lifelines in this troubled world. In the midst of pain and trauma, both past and present, joy can be revolutionary. So I don't want to downplay the hope for a nice full church with potlucks and bright, happy singing, or singing that expresses our lament and our pain. Those things are good. We will continue to do those things. But do we allow ourselves to envision more than that? Do we allow ourselves to truly be caught up in the divine dance? It might be tempting to decide, since Peter missed the mark in assuming a political messiah, that Jesus' message is not political at all. Jesus does not fit neatly into any political box, that's for sure whether now, nor in the first century. That wasn't really Jesus' bag. But the reality is that we must be willing to be transformed and have our very lives transformed and our very paradigms transformed, like Peter's was. And if the paradigm goes, then the future you're envisioning is inherently political. It's not about necessarily who is president or who's in Congress. It's not even as specific as that because those things are important, but it's political because it's about public life. It's beyond our individual lives. It's beyond our little communities. When Jesus said he was building a kingdom, he meant it, or kingdom, as we've talked about before. It's a kingdom that is far reaching and a different way of life altogether for all of us. So this week, I encourage you to be willing to have Jesus ask that question of you, who do you say that I am? And be willing to envision a different kingdom. Be willing to radically shift your paradigm. Be willing to be caught up in the divine dance and never look back. Amen. We will continue in worship, singing hymnal worship book 407, We Are People of God's Peace. No, I'm sorry, that is not true. We are singing How Firm a Foundation, number 567. I jumped right ahead. 567, verses 1, 2, and 4.
time for the work, the time when we share in the work of our church. I'm going to try something a little different. Can you guys hear me all right if I stand over here? Okay. Tell me if you can't hear me, I'll shout. Normally I use two microphones, but I want to be able to hear all of you and not get feedback. Uh, unpleasant feedback. I want good feedback. So friends, let us go now, for we cannot go where God is not. Go with purpose, allowing God to shift your paradigm. And go, my friends, in peace, for it is the gift of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.